Okay. Welcome to the last block of the session, environmental factor driving diversity and composition of fossil and living com Antarctic communities from me and my colleagues, Fernanda Quaglio and Eugenia Raffi. Just to remember you, you will have 16 minutes for each presentation. Maybe we are a little bit late, so <laughs> even some minutes less. And after the first three presentation, we will have question and answer. And then other two presentation. You already know that presentation is recorded, but if you want to stop the recording during your presentation, you have only to ask us for that. So, Fernanda, if you want to start. Hello, everybody. So now we finally will have uh, the pleasure to hear Romana Melis with the presentation, The Cool Water Carbonate Factory of the Western Ross Sea Continental Shelf, Antarctica, a key for the study of the cli climatic and oceanographic variations in the last 13,000 years. Please, Romana, you just have to unmute your microphone and start. Fabi, I think you have to present her. She's muted, I think. Yes. You can try Romana, to unmute. Her. Yes, now you're unmuted. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if it is possible to. Uh, can you see my my screen in this moment? No, we, we can't. Can, we can see your face, but you you yeah. should never mind because uh, Fabiana. I'm will, sharing uh, the screen. Yes. You share your your presentation, so you just. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Ask thank, her thank to pass the slide. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Oh, okay. For this. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. So just um, ask me to move on when you want. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for my <laughs> disaster. Okay, this communication uh, concerns a study of uh, uh, biogenic uh, polar carbonates. <clears throat> And uh, this, uh, the scientific interest in these studies is increasing over time since uh, they are very important paleoecological proxies uh, in the study of these, uh, these uh, polar settings. Um, since biogenic carosediments is very rare uh, in settings where silicoplastic <coughs> sediment prevail due to the uh, well-known uh, characters of uh, water masses, that is uh, low temperature, choose high uh, CO2 co uh, concentration that uh, leading the, this kind of water mass is very aggressive to the uh, calcium carbonate and uh, leading uh, the dissolution more or less at depth uh, over uh, 100 meters. And this, uh, this condition can disfavor, disfavor the carbonate factor. Uh, however, there are some sector in uh, um, Rossi area in Antarctica where it is possible to find very important contribution biogenic carbonate. It is possible to see this, uh, <clears throat> in these pictures uh, the composition of these uh, very coarse, uh, very poorly sorted sand and gravel uh, composition uh, in which bryozoa and mollusks and uh, stilaster is very common. In the, at the bottom, the, this picture represents the um, one box core in the modern sediments in which uh, it is possible to observe the presence, a very interesting presence of steel steroids, that is hydrozoan corals. <clears throat> you can change, please, the slide. Okay, the, the carbonate factory can act in, uh, in a sector uh, of the Ross Sea continental shelf where um, during uh, the last uh, glacial maximum there, there, uh, there was uh, um, the ice sheet um, didn't reach the continental uh, shelf break that is in the northwestern part, uh, the western part, uh, highlighted by the uh, 
green arrow and uh, in the picture on the right it's possible to follow the, uh, the uh, grounding line uh, um, retreat across the Rossi area starting from the LGM number one until the number two the last phase is of this retreat and uh, but uh, the carbonate factory could uh, could uh, develop also in, uh, in in the area <coughs> where the ice sheet didn't reach the the bottom and uh, the the, pos the positional model uh, could be showed in the uh, picture on the on the left proposed by uh, Frank Otters. Um, uh, they their model suggests that uh, carbonate uh, factories operate during glacial advance of the ice shelf and uh, uh, then this carbonate factory reduce the activity uh, um, above all during the instability and the ice retreat uh, period uh, during this period uh, in fact uh, very high um, contribution of terrigenous sediment due to the melt water uh, obviously uh, can reach uh, the, the outer part of, uh, of the continental shelf so this favoring the the carbonate factory. You can change, please, the slide. <clears throat> okay, here we can see uh, once uh, the, the study area that is uh, um, following the contribution of the Proto and the other and authors and the Smith authors. So we can see the distribution, main distribution in green in on the left right and left uh, of the. Um, um, Calcareo sediments in the modern uh, Rossi uh, continental shelf and the main uh, uh, water masses in uh, recent uh, environment and uh, um, uh, on the bottom of the picture uh, I write the sector we, pre we will present uh, that is uh, the study uh, the results uh, concerning the micropaleontological uh, study of three cores located <coughs> in this part of the Rossi continental shelf to escape uh, there recovered during uh, some uh, uh, Italian project uh, in the last years. You can change, please. Uh, here it is possible to observe that carbonate production. Uh, we are uh, on the left uh, in the Drigaski basin. <clears throat> where uh, several calls highlight uh, the occurrence, mainly occurrence of uh, siliciclastic silici sediments and uh, on the contrary, um, going uh, uh, toward the shelf break, it is core 25 and 16. It, very, it is very uh, interesting to, uh, to evidence that accumulation cal cal carbonate can, uh, can go <clears throat> over the uh, 20 or 30 percent uh, and uh, uh, this area is uh, very interesting to study the biogenic carbonate. Can go over uh, another slide please. Uh, why study this biogenic uh, accumulation? Because this uh, biogenic accumulation uh, up to now is Consider it as uh, the results of massive accumulation that is the material displaced uh, above all from other uh, adjacent banks uh, and uh, subjected to different um, reworking processes when uh, the carbonate factories is uh, uh, inactive, that is the solution, fragmentation, phys uh, physical reworking. However, this substrate can provide very interesting microhabitats for several microorganisms like uh, foraminifers and ostracot. And uh, in this regard, we started to, to study these uh, microfossils, to analyze this, uh, this sector, and uh, with aim to identify the, the main uh, uh, glacial dynamic during the late quaternary. In addiction, <clears throat> recovery of this kind of sediment could be very interesting to uh, offer the possibility to form chemical analysis, isotopes or oxygen carbon, uh, to um, better reconstruct the paleogenographic and paleoclimatic variation of this uh, sector. You can go to the other slide, please. Uh, the first 
example I, uh, I will show you is uh, the, the study of a cork located uh, near Cape Adair that is uh, um, uh, evidenced by the green uh, uh, arrow. Uh, this core is located uh, in front of Cape Adair toward the shelf break. It is very interesting since it is characterized by a um, strong uh, accumulation of uh, uh, sediments, biogenic sediment like, uh, for many, uh, like uh, Briozona, C.S. Davis, Moscow, and so on. And uh, these um, sedimentary sequences is uh, interrupted um, by some uh, um, interval characterized by more terrigenous um, uh, input. You can go to the next. Uh, Okay, uh, studying uh, um, several um, uh, proxy indicator, textural, compositional, uh, and uh, um, concerning calcium, calcium carbonate uh, uh, concentration, uh, we can, um, we had uh, um, highlighted that uh, uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this period, uh, that is during the last 30 <coughs> uh, kilo years ago, before present, uh, several uh, uh, periods of active carbonate are interrupted, um, interrupted by a period of the, uh, the um, uh, decrease of the carbonate factor due to the, the um, input of terrigenous uh, uh, sediments. You can go the other slide please and uh, using uh, benthic foraminifera and ostracods uh, here are presented by pca analysis it, it was possible it has been possible uh, um, um, evidence that uh, some period in uh, blue uh, uh, there are the period when uh, the carbonate factory mainly operates that is uh, at uh, age uh, uh, during miss two at around uh, 1790 uh, kilo year before uh, present and uh, around 15 and uh, around uh, 10 uh, uh, kilo years before present. On the contrary, the carbonate factor reduced at about uh, 21, 16, uh, and 17, that is uh, more or less during the period, uh, the post uh, the LGM degradation, uh, which is considered uh, to start around 18 kilo years before present. Other very interesting period are around uh, 14 kilo, kilo year before present and during the first part of the all seen. And this period likely correspond to the melt water pulse um, 1A and 1B. And the last one could be considered as a termination 1B uh, correspond, could correspond to an Antarctic early uh, clim climatic Holocene optimum. Can go to the to the other slide. So to this is the graphical abstract uh, in which it's possible to observe that uh, the high production of carbonate factory occurs during the advance of ice shelf. And uh, it is characterized uh, mainly represented by <coughs> um, foraminifera like uh, Epistomene lexigua, which is a, um, a foraminifera which represents uh, the uh, input of high nutrient uh, current and um, um, uh, another uh, microorganisms that is uh, the ostracod, Pseudocitar caudata, which uh, is the, the same behavior. And on the contrary, due during the retreat of the ice shelf, it is possible to observe that other foraminifers like Chibichides, which is uh, which represent in modern sediments high hydrodynamism, and Australicitere polylica can represent this condition of the, the re reduction of the carbonate factory. We can go on, please, the next. Uh, another example, uh, we move to the eastern part of the, uh, toward the, the north, uh, northern Drigaski Chaff. Uh, <clears throat> here it is possible to, to observe another core, very interesting uh, uh, contribution uh, of carbonate, in which uh, it is possible to observe that the base is characterized by uh, a, a strong occurrence of ice after the breeze, the base and the upper part. Once again, uh, there is a, a strong accumulation by gene carbonate, mainly composed by bryozoan, hydrozoan, stellastelid, and so on. You can go on. 
Uh, this uh, this uh, core is uh, in uh, understudy, um, but for the moment we can say that uh, carbonate factory is active uh, <clears throat> until during the, the last glacial mass maximum until more or less 10 uh, uh, kilo years before present, but uh, the, the dates are uncorrected because we are waiting for uh, other new data. And uh, um, after that, uh, the carbonate production is very reduced in relation probably to the, um, to the um, uh, retreat of the uh, ice front. And this is uh, mainly testified by the reduction, uh, totally reduction of the ice raft debris. In this case, uh, the foraminifer association is not very, very um, in agreement with the, 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 the other core, but uh, in this case, uh, the foraminifer association indicated that uh, a constant circulation of uh, nutrient water coming from the upper slope uh, could be observed during uh, all this period. You can change, please. <clears throat> Uh, these, uh, these are the pre preliminary geochemical analysis of this core uh, using uh, one benthic foraminifer, that is the Cibici de Sadefulgens, and one uh, um, plantonic foraminifer, the only one uh, which can survive in this uh, environment, that is ne Neoglobo quadrina pachyderma. And uh, the first result, uh, which could be, uh, have to be refined, <clears throat> suggests uh, for the moment uh, some very interesting results since uh, for the bottom uh, settings, uh, the, the results for geochemical analysis uh, fit very well with the, the geochemical signature of the circumpolar deep water during all the glacial period, confirming an agreement that during the, the glacial period when the, the ice front reached the continental shelf age, um, the unmodified circum circumpolar deep water could enter the shelf cavity has not been opposed by the isolated shelf water. On the contrary, the prevalence of Antarctic uh, um, surface water characterized all the water columns, surficial water columns, where Neoglobocodrina pachyderma can live. You can go to the other, please. And, uh, another one. Uh, to finish, I don't know what time uh, is it, and uh, um, I would present in, uh, the, the last one, uh, core, uh, the, um, uh, was a micropaleontological study is uh, still in progress, but for the moment uh, you can say, see that uh, also in this core there is a, a very interesting um, accumulation of uh, uh, um, carbonate and over 20% uh, over in some part. And uh, um, this uh, um, biologic, biogenic uh, um, elements uh, are similar to the previous cores so that is uh, mainly pre presented by bluezone and steel asteroids. Hydrocorals, and um, we can go to the, the, the next uh, core, uh, to the next slide to finish. And um, to finish, uh, we studied uh, uh, in a, with a joint venture uh, for a mini uh, ostracods to, to reach uh, the best uh, definition of this carbonate factory and using ostracods, it was possible. To, at, to, at, uh, to highlight several uh, three main assemblages representative of a glacial period that is uh, uh, of carbonate uh, when carbon fa factory operates and uh, assemblage uh, ostracods characterizing the period uh, when carbonate fa factory uh, is not favored it is during interglacial uh, period and also the uh, assemblage uh, characterizing the uh, stability phases of the uh, ice front and ostracods uh, in this uh, in this situation uh, might have been colon colonized the uh, um, shelf environments uh, uh, during the last glacial period, probably uh, surviving in the ice free areas, uh, as um, uh, recorded also by a recent uh, uh, macroplanetological study. And uh, very recently, uh, living uh, ostracods have been studied and published for the um, Rossi continental shelf. And to finish, 
um, the last one here we presented the the uh, the our paper concerning the carbonate factory the already published and uh, obviously i thank you very much for your attention and i apologize very much for my confusion okay thank okay. you thank you let's try to to, <laughs> to the time thank you romena okay. next presentation is by christine trevisa anil Cielfielian no. tree fern from the basal upper Cretaceous of the Livingstone Island, Antarctic Peninsula, and its close relations with the extent Thirsopteris elegans elegans cums. Okay, um, Romena, if you, I will mute you, okay? <laughs> okay, so, Chris, when you- Hello, uh, you can see my presentation? Yes. Perfectly, yes. Uh, it's, okay. you, you just have to put to, to um, present. Isso, obrigada. <laughs> yes? Not yet? No, no. Modo apresentação, Crisoca. Ali Pera embaixo, aí. do lado do ah, Zoom. Não. Não. Na sua barrinha laranja, embaixo, do lado direito, Onde tem aquela barra de zoom, tem o um símbolo para você apresentar. É ali. Não aparece. Um, let's see. Não é verdade? Uh, yes? No, no, not yet. No, not yet. No. Uh, I have a, uh, two monitors. Oh, if you try to turn off one of them, <laughs> yeah. I think it will be easier. Um, no. Uh, yes, and this, this. É esse aí, yes. vai, vai. Ok, ok. Espera aí, você apertou, mas não foi. No. But no, not. Uh, yes. And now? No. Not yet. You can try with the bottom right corner, close to the line for the zoom. There is a. Yes, this one. No, Wait. <risos> Quer passar sua apresentação para mim, Cris? Eu passo para você? Eu acho porque não... Assim, assim não dá? Não, né? Não, não está... Daqui eu não sei. Só se eu... Left... Are you sharing the full screen or only the presentation? Because... It usually happens if you share only the presentation. Try to share your full screen and try and then use the presentation mode. Uh, and now? Mm, no. Not yet. Nope. No. No, you can send me your, your, your file and, and I, I present it for you. It's okay. One? Yes. Um, share. No. Uh, now, yes. Now, okay. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yes. 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 Please. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay. 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> and uh, hello, uh, my name is Christian Trevisan, and I work in the scientific department of the Chilean Antarctic Institute. And I will present a part of the work we do here uh, with Palo Botan in, in Chile. Uh, in this case, today, it would be studied uh, of a new Seattle Island tree farm from the basal upper Cretaceous of Livingstone Island, uh, Antarctica Peninsula, and it close relations uh, with the extent Chirsopteris elegans. This plant is um, uh, a fern, uh, uh, Peter Doff. Uh, for introduce, uh, the Peter Doffis and conifers have been important of high latitudes fossil, uh, uh, represented fossil flora since the early Mesozoic and uh, in mainly, mainly at the end of the Cretaceous uh, because where the ferns that exist today and also uh, uh, angiosperm appear. And um, from, the, from the beginning, well uh, established in the high latitudes through the Cretaceous, they uh, will witness the arrival of angiosperms and a great change in the in the landscape, uh, encouraging uh, diversity and emergence of modern groups. For example, uh, families of ferns, Polypogiaceae and Dryopteridaceae. Uh, these families are, are, are families of ferns that have an origin in the end of Cretaceous. For Copeland, uh, the lands of Antarctica would be center of origin the many groups of uh, pterodactyls. Here are uh, some adaptive advantages this this group, um, like a uh, low light photosynthetic ability and ability to disperse by transporting the spores uh, through the hair, and resisted uh, a high resistance to diseases uh, caused by most moisture saturated and, uh, environments. And the, the very important um, uh, ad uh, advantage, uh, tolerance to disturbed environments, especially in, in volcanic areas, uh, being uh, pioneers after the eruption. Uh, in this case, it's very important characteristic because until now, we know uh, that the history, okay, uh, sorry, uh, and, uh, this today, as a, this adaptation is already uh, well studied in volcanoes around the world, such as in the United States, for example, Santa Elena. And we also see it, it today in Chile, uh, here, in, uh, here in Chile, uh, for example, in Chaiten, it's very interesting because the eruption occurs. Uh, so after the volcanic eruption occurs, the first plants uh, that appear are the ferns. Uh, here, uh, uh, um, the picture uh, shows the distribution of modern pteridophytes. It's very interesting because today the ferns concentrate uh, uh, their greatest diversity in the tropics, but uh, also adapted in polar regions. In the past, uh, uh, was um, very important in the polar regions. Uh, here, the, the, this work uh, has as ob objective uh, recognize the pitrid of flora that occupied uh, the southern high latitudes of Gondwana and describe a new form of tree fern and uh, to understand its paleogeography and paleoenvironment paleo implications. So, what do we know about the Antarctica paleoflora? It's very interesting because until now, until now uh, we know that the history the, of Antarctica continent is much older, let's see here, is much older the history of the peninsula, okay? 
uh, we can see uh, here on the continent, floodlands represented by Glossopteris and Dicroidium. And in, in deposits uh, representative uh, Permian and Triassic. And in, in the uh, Antarctica Peninsula, the deposits are more young. We, we can see here uh, plants, uh, Cretaceous plants, um, we, uh, how ferns and conifers and to angiosperms. In, in our uh, study area, so is the uh, Antarctica Peninsula. In this map uh, of the Antarctica Peninsula, and uh, we see the location of the South Shetland Island and proposed eight, uh, aids to the geological units and uh, some plant assemblage. We see uh, in this island, uh, Adelaide, Adelaide Island, Livingston Island, and King George Island. Too. Uh, we see here, uh, we can see the sites, the, the Livingston Island uh, that contain records of ferns, ferns fossils, and the proposed ages. In, in this case, uh, our uh, study area is a uh, Hannah Point in the south uh, of uh, Livingston Island. And here uh, we can see the, 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 the main place, uh, place with plant fossils and uh, their deposits. And now, uh, in better detail, a uh, geological cross section along the upper Cretaceous volcanic successions, uh, showing the showing the units with fossils. Uh, usually, the fossils uh, occurs in the fine sediments in the top, the the uh, the section. Uh, in the, in the fine deposits uh, contains the how uh, crystal tuff and volcanic volcanic uh, rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, these pictures uh, show the diversity uh, found in the outcrop of Hannah Point, uh, and as we can see, it's an abundant flora compass uh, uh, for of many pteridophytes. Many ferns uh, with the reproductive structure, sterile pinas, uh, fertile pinas. It's very interesting the, the fossils. But uh, about all these fossils, we have studied uh, until now, uh, especially this farm. Uh, why? Uh, because we, we also found the reproductive uh, structure. As we will we'll see later, here we can see the sterilipina, this farm, sterilipina with the taxonomic uh, characteristics, uh, uh, how um, racks, uh, the racks, the, the base, the current base, asymmetric pinolis. And here we can see uh, another farm uh, showing the epicopina. Uh, it's very common in ferns, the shape uh, to indicate the position of pinna in the plant. So this form indicates uh, that a pro a probably apical pinna or the, the apical part of the, the front, uh, fern front. Here, the, the more important um, fossil, uh, we also, can, uh, we can see the Fertilipina with the Sorus uh, preserver and its forms. Uh, these characters are similar to ferns that uh, today uh, are, are part of the family Cetacea or the tree fern family Cetacea. Uh, uh, this, this picture is very interesting because this fern is a Cicadacea uh, fern. Uh, today, 
in this case, this plant is uh, to soften elegance. It's very interesting because this plant today lives only in Juan Fernandez Island in the coast of Chile and is a monotype species. Uh, and our studied fossil uh, shows similar characteristics with the, this form. It's very uh, close the, the, the characteristics with the fossil. Here uh, we have a, a detail, the, this, this plant, the sterile penis and the fertile penis with sorus. Finally, uh, here we have uh, the environment uh, where Chesopter uh, elegans uh, lives today, where it's very interesting because we were, were, were forming dense underground in high parts of the, the island. It's a very beautiful place. Because, uh, and the, the, this plant uh, is, is abundant in this this island. So um, with that to infer about this neutral fern, yes, uh, uh, and found in, in our final remarks, the Antarctica could have been the origin of many ferns, uh, safe, and, and and the Juan Fernandez Island uh, can be a good modern analog today because uh, we, we, we founded this plant in Juan Fernandez and in Antarctica in the Cretaceous. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Very nice presentation. Let's go. To the next one from another Brazilian, Luisa da Silva. Her environmental changes recorded during the Maastrichtian Danian at the Filo Negro section, Seymour Island, Antarctica. Luisa, do you have your, uh, your presentation? You just uh, share a screen and it will appear for us. Uh, I have sent my presentation uh, in video. You sent a video to the SCAR, so we have to ask to, uh, the IT team to play the video. Yes, yes, I have sent the video. So the IT team can you help us with this and play the video by, by Luisa? Okay, thank you. Thank you. My name is Luisa Carini, and today I will present you my study entitled Paleoenvironmental Changes Recorded During the Maastrichtian to Danian at the Filo Negro Section, Seymour Island, Antarctica. This study has been developed in collaboration with other colleagues from Unicinos University at Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. The Cretaceous Paleogene Transition, or KPG, was an age marked by enormous extinctions throughout the Earth. The most accepted causes for these large extinctions are assigned to an asteroid impact at Chicxulub, Mexico, and to the intense Deccan Traps volcanism in India. The present study was focused on studying the KPG transition in a section located at Seymour Island in the Antarctic Peninsula. The study area is inserted in the James Ross Basin, and herein we approach the Marambio group, specifically the Lopes de Bertodano formation at the Filo Negro section located here. This study area, besides presenting a well-preserved KPG sedimentary record, is important for being a high-latitude section. 
Studying high latitude sites is important as they represent the most extreme climatic conditions on Earth, helping scientists to better understand the climatic behaviors on Earth and thus enhancing climate change predictions. 11 meters of the Filo Negro section were studied in this work. Its sedimentary succession consists of silty to very fine grain the sandstones, slightly differing in gloconite content and color, with a greenish color in the gloconitic beds. Although the Filo Negro section is very fossiliferous and exhibits an iridium anomaly, it has not been thoroughly studied yet. It is also important to better define the position of the KPG transition in the section. Thus, in this study, we aim to provide more information about the paleoenvironmental settings around the KPG transition registered at the Filo Negro section using palynological and geochemical proxies. For this, our specific goals are to better position the KPG transition in the section, infer about local paleoenvironmental changes, and characterize the paleoclimatic settings from the latest Maastrichtian to the early Danian. 35 palynological samples were prepared using acids to dissolve the carbonatic and the siliceous contents. The palynological slides were analyzed under a Zeiss Axioscope 40 optical microscope. 200 palynomorphs were counted from each slide for paleoenvironmental inferences. Considering dinoflagellate cysts or dinocysts and sporomorphs, the PG ratio was adopted in order to infer on marine paleoproductivity and more proximal or distal environments along the section. The TM ratio was also used to make inferences on more proximal or distal paleoenvironments. Neolacoids and pyridinoids are separated while counting the dinocysts and they can be deferred from each other by observing their morphology. The gonialacoid dinocysts are considered autotrophic, while the pyridinoids are heterotrophic. Considering this, higher values of the PG ratio indicate higher marine productivity due to higher nutrient availability. This may also indicate higher proximity to the coast due to higher sediment input, which brings more nutrients to the ocean. Different statistical analyses were applied to the palynological numerical data. First, the cluster analysis was applied in order to divide the section into different palynological intervals and subintervals. The main candle trend test was used to verify the existence of increasing or decreasing trends in the groups along the section. Finally, the key squared test was used to make a comparison of proportions between gonialacoids and pyridinoids and pollen grains and spores from the Maastrichtian and from the Danian. Different geochemical proxies have been used to support our paleoenvironmental inferences and the position of the KPG transition in this section. The first one was titanium against aluminium, the second one iron against potassium, the third proxy used was barium against terrigenous elements such as aluminium, titanium, and iron for paleoproductivity interpretations. And finally, the siderophil elements and the iridium concentrations were used for chronostratigraphic purposes. 25 genera and 41 dinocyst species were identified in this study. And the main ones are represented here by the photomicrographs. For example, Istricosferidium tubiferum, 
Manumiela Druge e Felodinho Magnífico. 34 genera e 55 species de sporomorphs foram identificadas também. Well. Por exemplo, Retitrilates austroclavaditis e Philocladidites monsoni. As the result of palynological counts, curves were generated for the main observed genera of sporomorphs in orange and dinocysts in blue. We can see that in interval A, there is a high abundance of sporomorphs, especially pollen grains, with an increase of Levigatus puritis ovatus and Philocladidites as the most abundant genus among sporomorphs. In the same interval, we can also see low percentages of dinocysts, except for Manumiella at 3 meters in the section. Here is a peak of Manumiella, which is correlated with a TM ratio decay. Near sub-interval A3, there is a strong decrease of sporomorphs, which continues until interval B. Sub-interval A3 is marked by a rapid decrease of Manumiella SPP and higher abundance of Peleocystodinium SPP. During interval B, Other dinocyst genera also increase, especially Batiacasfera SPP. The gray line indicates the position of the KPG transition interpreted in this study. The strong decrease of Philocladiditis SPP mostly represented by Philocladiditis monsoni, is interpreted as a period of lower humidity, since this species is very sensitive to dry climatic conditions, according to Bauman and collaborators, 2014. Besides that, there is a drop in marine paleoproductivity shown by the PG ratio, which exhibits very low values in this part of the section. The TM ratio indicates a trend to more proximal paleoenvironments after the KPG transition. The interval C is marked by a recovery trend for sporomorphs, but still showing many fluctuations which can be related to the readjustment of the flora after the KPG event. We can also see a decreasing trend for the dinocysts. This figure is restricted to the upper part of the section from 8.6 to 11 meters in order to see with more detail the KPG event. Here we can notice a bloom of the dinocyst Batiacasfera SPP, as well as a drop in marine paleoproductivity shown by low amounts of barium. There is also an agreement between the increase of terrestrial palynomorphs and the titanium against aluminium ratio, indicating a trend for more proximal environments upwards especially in the Danian. However, there are some moments of drop in this ratio, which are correlated with concretions and an organic matter layer. This may indicate some periods of more distal settings, leading us to mark a flooding event at 9.9 meters. The progressive increase of pollen grain Notophagigitis SPP is an indicator of um, climatic cooling, according to Bauman and collaborators, 2014. While the general decrease of the iron potassium ratio indicates progressively less humid climatic 
to settings upwards. The peak of sidorophil elements at 9.6 meters is correlated with an iridium peak as well. Our interpretations were compared to the results of Bauman and collaborators 2014 exhibiting some similarities. Climatic conditions are thus inferred as relatively warm during the end of the Maastrichtian, cooling down in the earliest Danian and decreasing humidity conditions. In the biostratigraphical analysis, the Manumiela Druji rain zone of Bauman and collaborators 2012 was identified from the base of the section until 10.1 meters. The authors indicate that this zone may encompass the upper Maastrichtian and the earliest Danian. The species Dania californica, indicated by several authors as a Danian marker, has its first occurrence at 9.6 meters the same position as the siderophil elements and iridium peaks. All of this led us to mark the KPG transition from 9.5 to 9.6 meters in this section. The hysterocosphiridium to be film zone was not observed herein. The T-squared test proved the existence of significant differences between the amounts of pyridinoid and gonioloquoid dinocysts from the Maastrichtian and the Danian. In order to make a comparison between both ages, the mean percentages of gonioloquoid and pyridinoid dinocysts have been calculated. We can see a strong drop in pyridinoid genera such as Manumiela spp and a great increase in gonioloquoid genera, such as Pachacasferas spp. This is one more indicator that the marine pro productivity was higher during the end of the Maastrichtian in comparison with the earliest Danian. In conclusion, the KPG transition was po positioned between 9.5 and 9.6 meters in this section, defining its previous interval. A flooding surface was marked at 9.9 meters. And as for paleoenvironmental and paleoclimatic interpretations, during the Upper Maastrichtian, uh, the climate was more humid and relatively warm and there was higher marine paleoproductivity. During the KPG transition, the climate was less humid and marine, there was a marine paleoproductivity drop. Finally, in the Danian, there were progressively cooler climatic conditions, more proximal environment, and a slight increase in marine paleoproductivity. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Luisa. So now we will not have the time for questions. Now we will leave the questions for later. So if you have questions, please uh, write them in the in the question box. So we will be able to. Um, make them to the authors later, okay? And now I pass the word to Fabiana, and Fabiana will moderate. The other Next speaker is Byron Adams with the presentation Community Assembly in the Wake of Glacial Retreat and Meta Analysis. Please, when you want, you can start. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. So today I'm going to talk about how soil ecosystems and soil communities assemble as glaciers uh, retreat. 
And so the, the formation of these glacial forefields that appear in front of retreating glacier, uh, glaciers are really prominent features becoming more and more prominent with the rapidly changing cryosphere. There's climate driven changes, the cryosphere is uh, decreasing and uh, retreating uh, across the globe. Here's a, a photograph of the Alesh Glacier in 1856, and then again in 2001, and you can see the, the large difference between these two, and uh, some contrasts in the features that are different between the two as well. With the ice mass loss, you also see the appearance of bare rock, and you see uh, the appearance of, um, <laughs> of, uh, of vegetation. And so glacial forefields are really uh, wonderful natural laboratories for studying primary ecological succession. So in the panel that you see here on the left from 1941, where you see a complete uh, a glacial, uh, the, the complete glacier, the decline is left in, in its absence, a large lake and some bare rocks here in 1950. By 2004, you see that area is completely vegetated and you have this massive, lake right here. Uh, again, these are examples from Europe and from North America. And the glacier retreat that we see in Antarctica uh, is not as well documented, is not as well understood. Um, but after 33 years, simply in, in this site that's in Washington and North America, note that what happens as this glacier retreats, as it leaves, it leaves in its wake uh, this area that's no longer glaciated and note uh, the appearance of all of this vegetation that you see on the surface of what's left behind. And so uh, today I want to talk about the process of ecological succession, what we know about it, and uh, how we can use what we know about ecological succession globally to make predictions about what we might find in Antarctica in the future. So um, the, the, what I wanna do today is talk about how universal patterns of ecological succession can be used to predict how the Antarctic soil communities are gonna respond to glacial retreat uh, in the future. And so if you go to a typical textbook in ecology where you're teaching your students about ecological succession, we, re we, we typically see a figure like this, which shows the bare rock, of course, here at the beginning. And then all of the focus is on what's going on above ground, right? We see uh, the changes in annual plants and lichens and then grasses and perennials up to grasses, shrubs, trees, and then finally climax community uh, with, with like oak and hickory trees, for example. And I, I'm always astounded that no one ever uh, talks about what's going on underground and how do soil ecosystems, uh, 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 how does ecological succession work in soil ecosystems? And so uh, uh, what we wanted to do uh, is to identify universal patterns of community succession uh, using meta-analysis. So what we're doing here is we're taking all of the published research that looks at ecological succession in response to glacial recession, and then seeing if we can identify universal patterns or trends that are common across all of these studies that have been done thus far. And so in order to do that, we gathered uh, research papers that were published from all around the world, obviously focusing on the cryosphere. So you can see sites in North America and uh, the Canadian high Arctic and in Greenland and Iceland. So most of these studies taking place here in Northern Europe, some in the Himalayas, some in uh, New Zealand, and then throughout South America. And then we have 12 sites from Antarctica that we were also, 12 publications from Antarctica that we were also able to consider. And so, uh, and that as a review, what, we, what I mean by meta-analysis is that we're using a statistical technique to come up with a quantitative summary of uh, how soil ecosystems uh, undergo ecological succession. And we're gonna use a statistical technique to identify significant changes that are, uh, that are consistent across all of the different studies that have been conducted. And so as you start to add more and more studies, you can increase your statistical power so that well, the, the um, explanatory power that you have can be uh, much more assured. And so in order to do this, we use some comprehensive uh, meta-analysis software in order to come up with our results. 
And so it, 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 first I want to talk about the inclusion criteria. You can't just take any paper and do this. So the papers that we used had to uh, uh, include a glacial retreat area and they had to have quantitative primary data. So they couldn't, we, we had to throw out papers that were qualitative, for example. They had to have various study sites along or across a successional age, right? So if they only had one age, then we couldn't include that. They had to be natural field conditions and uh, they had to provide abundance, either the abundance and or the richness uh, of uh, taxa and or a soil property. So like uh, available phosphorus or organic carbon or pH or, or salinity or something like that. So papers that had these, we were able to uh, include, uh, but papers that did not have those, we had to exclude. So we had to exclude things that were like mesocosm or incubation studies or uh, uh, things that were not soil. So if they, if they looked at uh, 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 succession in streams or marine systems, or if they didn't have a chrono sequence, if all they provided was DNA concentration or cell numbers, we couldn't make any for inferences about taxonomic diversity or abundance that way. Um, and if they provided only uh, F values, for example, or qualitative, like like a taxon was rarely present or infrequent or very frequent, uh, we couldn't use qualitative uh, information in this. And also if they use things like PFLA or coverage of bacterial fragments instead of actual mean uh, values, we, we couldn't use those papers. So those are the types of papers that we had to throw in the trash. Um, and so here's what our systematic literature search looked like. Uh, we searched for basically everything we possibly could. And that search yielded about uh, 1,060 records, a little bit over 1,000 records. And so we start out with 1,000 of these records. Then we had to go through every single one of these papers and see if they were actually relevant, right? So we had to use our inclusion and exclusion criteria. We found 252 that were relevant. And of those, uh, there were 95 uh, publications that had all of that met all of our criterion. And that included what we uh, identified as 1,524 studies. And by studies, a single paper, you know, a single paper could have uh, data on uh, mosses and lichens and nematodes and uh, multiple taxa. And so that's how we could get more studies than actual papers, right? So, so we ended up with 1,524 studies from 95 publications. And if we look across the, the article selection, the articles that we were able to keep, and we look at the prevalence of the taxonomic groups that were in these articles, if we look at the number of uh, studies, we end up with uh, 389 that include the soil properties, very strong. And you can see a lot here with bacteria and fungi and also with plants and insects. A little bit fewer were the spiders and the nematodes and some of the other arthropods and lichens. Uh, but that's right. So we took those and then we proceeded. This is just an example of what our data sheet looks like. We had tons and tons of data. This was so much work. But this is an example of how one particular paper could yield multiple studies, right? So we ended up with 18 data series from a single paper because of the types of information that they included. And then again, this meta-analysis does include about 12 papers that were published specifically just on from Antarctica. And so um, just to describe the study, uh, we looked at effect size and moderator variables. So in this particular statistical analysis, what we considered effect sizes was taxonomic abundance and taxon richness. So those are our effect sizes. And then the moderator variables looked at how these scored against successional ages, okay? And, and, and so we divided the time series up into 0 to 10, 11 to 30, 31 to 50, 51 to 100, 101 to 500, and then studies that uh, looked at a chrono sequence that was older than 500 years for each of these taxa. And I'll also say that many of these taxa, we were able to break down into even smaller taxonomic groups, as you'll see here in just a minute. So... The data that I'm going to show you here uh, will include mean values with confidence intervals, 
And in doing so, we calculated a p-value, and that p-value is an, a, a indicative of the true variation among the effect sizes, right? So uh, our p-values, we have a lot of confidence in those. Um, and, and this is where Q takes into account of heterogeneity, and then there's an I-squared value, which, uh, takes, which asks which proportion of the variation is real. And that's all captured here in the p-values that I'm going to show. Um, we looked at non-parametric variance here and here with the non-parametric variance. It's a function of the sample size and also the number of studies from each article uh, divided by the number of the time points. <laughs> and so uh, here is a look at the data that we recovered. Um, there are some uh, uh, trends that pop out really clearly. So if we look at the amount of total carbon in the system. We can see that total uh, carbon and total organic carbon increase with time, as well as microbial carbon all increase linear with time. Dissolved organic carbon and you know, total nitrogen. Uh, these are all uh, highly significant. Um, so on, on the other end, we see some trends where, uh, where's the one I want to show the phosphorus. So the phosphorus, uh, available phosphorus will increase for a little bit and then it starts to decrease as, uh, as it starts to be uh, scavenged and picked up by the organisms. You also see this down here with the pH. You can see that pH starts pretty close to neutral and then becomes uh, more acidic over time. Um, plants and lichens typically increase linearly over, over time. This sort of makes sense, right? You start out with bare rock and eventually vegetation cover overall increases. But that trend is, is real for vascular plants, for non-vascular plants, and for lichens. And interestingly here, you see, start to see a decrease in lichen abundance over time. Even though lichen uh, diversity or richness in, increases, you see the abundance here starts to go down. We think that may have something to do with competition with other plants like vascular and non-vascular plants. Um, this is a breakdown of bacteria so uh, into these taxonomic groups. And, uh, and in order to save a little bit of time and get us back on schedule, I'll skip through some of these and go to a, a slide that summarizes much of this work. Um, but a couple of things that I do want to highlight here is that uh, this trend here, many of these bacteria increase linear over time, right? Like the actinobacteria, for example. But there are also some important bacteria that we see declining over time, like these pioneer species, the cyanobacteria, which are the carbon fixers, typically thought of as pioneering species. We see a gradual decline uh, in their uh, 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 taxonomic, in their abundance over time. Um, and then, uh, and, and a few other bacteria as well, like the proteobacteria. They start out as pioneers and then they decrease over time. Whereas there are a lot of other bacteria that, you know, tend to increase, um, increase uh, uh, with their richness in abundance uh, over time. Uh, the, the fungi, uh, we start to see uh, not much uh, significance here with the fungi in terms of their abundance, but in terms of richness, we see fungal enrichment, uh, richness uh, in increase among a couple of these uh, uh, fungal taxa. Um, uh, nematodes, what's interesting here is that we see that the nematodes will increase over time in abundance as well as in richness for the omnivores. Um, and uh, but for the uh, uh, bacterial feeders, the bacterial feeders, we tend to see that their, their richness starts out fairly low or fairly high, and then it will decrease over time. Um, and the, if we're looking at arthropods and incotraids, you'll see that the columbola, these are really common uh, microarthropods in Antarctica, we see a linear increase in both their uh, abundance and in their richness over time. It's pretty common for, for all of these taxa. Um, if you look at things like uh, Hymenoptera, Hymenoptera increase significantly over time. Spiders increase significantly over time um, in, in abundance as well as in richness. Um, flies also, fly richness goes up over time. Um, 
Uh, plants overall, we see that the plant richness uh, increases, but we don't see a lot of statistical significance in the plant richness changes, but we certainly do see uh, significant trends here uh, in the bryopsida and in the panopsida and in the magnoliopsida uh, in terms of their overall abundance over time. Uh, I'm going to skip to some, uh, uh, it, we broke the beetles down and, and we we're able to go do a deep dive uh, because the people that study these things do a deep taxonomic dive. So the resolution that we we're able to use is limited only by the resolution that's used by the uh, researchers who are conducting these studies. All right, so here's the summary slide that I wanted to, to show you. And, and in this slide, I want to point out that here's, here's what we call our, our, our uh, our uh, uh, heat matrix here. So for the for this heat map, uh, everything sort of starts out right about here in gray. So initially, if it's present, it shows up here in gray, and then from zero to ten years. And then over time, what we're showing is some taxa are increasing in abundance and diversity, and others are decreasing in abundance and diversity. And I want to highlight that here by just dividing this figure in half. And so the taxa that you see on the top, the trend is that they start out and pretty much have a linear increase in their abundance over time. So that includes things like the actinobacteria and the zygomycota, the plant feeding nematodes and the omnivorous nematodes are in that group, Columbula, mites, incotraeids. Hymenopterans, lichens, and vegetation, overall vegetation, they all see a pretty much linear, a statistically significant linear trend increasing in diversity and abundance over time. However, it's interesting to note that some of these taxa start out fairly abundant, uh, like pioneer taxa. They're able to get to these areas, they're able to disperse to these areas, and then over time, they may increase a little bit, right? So some of these taxa increase up to about 50 years and then afterwards they decrease uh, in, uh, in, in time. And this may have to do with biotic effects, things like competition and predation and those sort of things uh, where they do well uh, starting out as pioneering species and then they decline. And so some of those taxa that we see are the acidobacteria, the chloroplexes, the planktomycetes, ascomycotes, and basidiomycotes. Also, the, these bacterial feeding nematodes start out fairly abundant. And then, uh, and then after about 50 years, they start to decline, along with the opiolones, the coleopterans, dipterans, spiders. And then these four groups of, of bacteria, so the bacteria deities, the proteobacteria, beta proteobacteria, and also interesting, the, the cyanobacteria, which are really good pioneers, uh, but then eventually perhaps become, start to become outcompeted by some of these other taxa up here. And so um, this is just a, a summary of the taxa that increase over the chronal sequence, the increase and, de and then decline, or those that de just constantly decreased over from, from time zero up to over 500 years. These taxa just uh, were in the constant decrease, uh, along with consistent with this decrease in pH from neutral down to a, a, a very acidic. And so this slide sort of summarizes the, the, the taxonomic groups and their behavior over this chrono sequence over time in ecological su succession. And so the take home message I want to leave with everyone today is that we think that we've generated a new null hypothesis for how we could predict that soil ecosystems will evolve uh, under, uh, echo, uh, under glacial recession. So as uh, ice sheets and glaciers in these ecosystems are retreating, we predict that these soil communities are going to follow these universal patterns of ecological succession that they won't exhibit. Uh, vastly different patterns than what we observe globally, and including the handful of uh, of studies to date that have taken place in eco uh, in in Antarctic soil ecosystems. So at this point, I just want to uh, thank uh, my collaborator here, uh, uh, Kumar uh, Satendra Kumar Patula. He's uh, the person who's responsible for the vast majority of this work, a postdoc in my lab. And I'll, I want to mention that uh, that uh, Sachindra is currently looking for another postdoc or 
a uh, tenure track position. And so uh, be on the lookout for him if anybody is interested in that sort of stuff. And many thanks to the National Science Foundation for funding this work and my colleagues at the LTR network, uh, the McMurdo LTER and here at Brigham Young University. Thank you so much for your contribution. And now next speaker is Anna Kondratieva. And the presentation is, are the mar existing marine protected areas of the southern phylodiversity? Hello. Hi. I'm sorry, my camera is not working, so. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Okay. Just share my screen. Is it okay? We cannot see it now. I also have the problems. <laughs> If you are not able to do that, you can send me your presentation. The mail address is in the chat box. No, no, no I can. I just, I have also two screens. I will just okay. switch on the first one. <laughs> okay, let's do it again. Okay, now we can see it. Yeah, should be working. Okay. Fine. So uh, I'm Anna and I'm working in Paris in a National um, Museum of Natural History. Uh, so I'm really grateful to be here today. I'm really excited to present my work. Uh, many thanks to organizing committee of SCAR 2022. Um, just to say, uh, I'm a terrestrial ecologist, usually working with plants. So this project for me was something new. I was discovering a lot of things about uh, marine ecology. And um, today I will talk to you about how can we access biodiversity patterns of the Southern Ocean fauna to better understand biodiversity and better preserve it. I would also I'd uh, like to thank Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition for financial support of this project. Well, uh, usually people are unaware of that Southern Ocean is really biologically rich. And it is so rich that uh, in 2014, um, uh, about 140 researchers made um, and published biogeographic atlas of the Southern Ocean, which uh, reconcile vast amounts of knowledge. And um, if you want to uh, look at, have a look at this amazing research work, it is now available online on Biodiversity EQ. Um, so biogeographic information is very important for monitoring biodiversity and detecting what impacts environmental changes could have on it. And then, it is important for designing conservation tools and rules, such as marine protected areas. Uh, well, just if you want to be up to date, you can take a look at the Register of Antarctic Species. And we see that today uh, we have almost 12,000 uh, species described, which is a lot. Well, uh, we live in a fast paced changing times and strong environmental pressure influences influences the, the, the structure and composition of biological diversity. And in the Southern Ocean, we have such climate change consequences as ice shelf collapses, um, ocean acidification or ocean warming. And also it is, it is difficult to generalize these effects of climate change across the entire Southern Ocean because it's quite big. Uh, the effects are beginning to manifest themselves in different regions. So we have to do something with that. Along with the climate change, there are resource exploitation, marine resources exploitation or fishing, uh, which threats marine biodiversity. And of course, the fishing is strongly supervised 
uh, by Kamler. And while we fish only only small fraction of biodiversity uh, represented by krill, and you can see uh, the big fishing points of krill in blue, and in red you have uh, two species of toothfish that are fished. Well, uh, there are still problems of the bycatching of non-target species and problems of depredation when predators get stuck uh, in, in fishing devices. So uh, this is also a problem and uh, a motivation to protect biodiversity. So uh, an effective way to protect marine biodiversity is to establish marine protected areas. Currently, we have seven big uh, MPAs uh, across the Southern Ocean. So the existing ones are in blue and green. Uh, two of them are Kamlar uh, managed. So the big one is here in uh, the Ross Sea. And the another one, the small one, is around the Orkney, so, uh, Thothan Orkney Islands. Um, we uh, now know, as Brooks and colleagues uh, found, that this, um, these MPAs that are existing today are not really representative of the Thothan Ocean ecoregions. When I say ecoregions, uh, that means that they could be used as a proxy to the biodiversity and different species uh, living in these ecoregions. So if we add to this uh, MPA network uh, some new MPAs, which uh, we have here proposed in orange, they are under a negotiation, uh, we could uh, protect more heterogeneous ecoregions. And the more we protect them, the more species diversity will be protected. So the question is how to decide where and why to create the MPAs. It's quite a problem. And usually the biology, uh, conservation biologists have this agony of choice. Where to start? Well, the good start po starting point would be measure biodiversity first and then decide where to protect the place when you have the most of it. So current uh, conservation plans largely rely on uh, evaluation of taxonomic diversity or species richness. Uh, they match protected areas with biodiversity hotspots defined by this number of species. So here we have an example. You have two spots, two um, geographical places with species. And if we count, we have five species here and five species there. So species richness tells us that five equals five. So the diversity is equal. It's quite limited as information. You can also use species abundances. And then uh, it will give you some more information on species diversity and their biological identity. For example, some species will be common, some species will be rare. And um, diversity uh, measures will be quite some, a bit different, but still they will ignore, uh, ignore the diversity of biological attributes like traits, or genetic diversity of these species. So all species will be also treated as equal. So if you don't want to treat them as equal, um, and if you have the corresponding data available, uh, you can use phylogenetic information, which takes into account species evolutionary history and potentially any unmeasured feature or any unmeasured character that we uh, couldn't measure when we, when we saw the species like morphological, behavioral, or physiological uh, characters. And if we use uh, species evolutionary diversification and uh, divergence and speciation rate as conservation targets, uh, it could help to better understand what we are protecting and why. So if you're not, uh, if you're not familiar with phylogenetic trees that I'm using uh, to develop phylogenetic diversity uh, studies, Basically, today they are mostly uh, based on the molecular data uh, of the sequences from species that you will align and it will bring you um, some kind of tree. So this is a tree uh, that will represent a degree of the relation between species. The species of interest will be the tips on the tips of the, of, uh, of the tree. And the branches will represent whether evolutionary time or substitutions per site. But we always need uh, some unit to measure the branch lengths on the phylogeny. And the easiest way to calculate 
phylogenetic diversity is uh, the phylogenetic diversity measure developed by Faith in 92, which calculates the sum of branch lengths of all species present in the site of interest. So phylogenetic diversity would integrate both the number of species and their history of evolutionary diversification. So for example, here we have two uh, spots, two um, geographical sites, uh, one in, in green and one in blue. And the phylogenetic diversity of green is smaller than uh, the PD of the blue one. Why? Because the species composing the community or with the green community are really close to each other. They are close relatives uh, on the tree. And thus, uh, uh, they, they, they represent less phylogenetic diversity uh, of this bird tree. Where, uh, while this uh, three spe blue species, they are quite uh, far away from each other. They are isolated on the tree and their branch lengths are uh, really lo uh, long. So the sum of branch lengths will be uh, bigger. So uh, phylogenetic aspect of biodiversity is still uh, lacking from the ecological studies in Antarctic in Antarctica and uh, from its conservation decision-making. Uh, to my knowledge, I haven't found something like that. So usually uh, studies that, uh, uh, that are interested in biodiversity of the southern ocean uh, use taxonomic diversity uh, measures as we've seen before. And there is no study that would have mixed uh, uh, several large taxonomic groups, or if it is the case, they are often limited in space, like here on the peninsula or uh, or in the Ross Sea. Um, and there are some other uh, studies that would use uh, genetic information to study genetic structure of the species populations using, for example, Maybe you've seen uh, these uh, schemes, which represent the haplotype uh, networks. And these studies are really uh, great because often people create phylogenetic trees with this data. And this is what we need. So now when you under uh, you've understood uh, why phylodiversity is important, uh, I will tell you about the how it is distributed across the southern ocean, whether marine protected areas are representative of it, and how environmental variables could explain these patterns. So this work is a uh, still in progress. I'm still adapting my methods to fit the best made data and to answer my questions. So uh, this project would like to cover as many animal species, marine animal species as possible. And to calculate phylodiversity uh, and its species occurrences and species phylogenies. Well, uh, my occurrence data comes from public depositories, uh, OBIS and JABIF, which includes many different sources of data. So if you use this uh, the data from these websites, which are great because there are so, uh, really, really many data. Uh, you have to be really attentive to uh, in checking for any possible errors. So for me, one occurrence was species name uh, and its co uh, geographical coordinates. I didn't include uh, time because it's not uh, available for around two thirds of my data, but it could be interesting for later to study the subset with time. Uh, composant. Then I um, verified the species names with the worms register of marine species. And um, my study area consisted in the, okay, this is bigger than the usually, even than we usually define the southern ocean. Um, but I wanted to compare my results with the results that uh, were published in the, um, in the atlas uh, of the southern ocean. And um, as you can see here in blue, this is the polar front, which is considered as a, um, a natural barrier for many species living in the southern ocean. So uh, this could allow us to compare uh, the phylogenetic diversity uh, on the both sides. So today we'll show you the results of four different species groups, artisans, uh, ray-finned fishes, uh, Pycnogonids, which are 
also called sea spiders and Ophiura or serpent stars. So this choice was uh, constricted by the availability of phylogenetic data because um, in this project, we don't have time to construct our own phylogenies, but we use the phylogenies already made by these great people. So uh, these phylogenies are dated in time, but sometimes they have, uh, th there are some species missing from my occurrence data. So I had to add them by myself. With a, I found an automated a way to do it called uh, phylogenetic imputation, which do it uh, randomly, but many times. So uh, on average, it's a quite a nice uh, way to do that. And uh, then I've calculated uh, phylogenetic diversity in each grid cell, which I considered as uh, a community living together. So uh, what can we see in these maps? Here we have the species richness of the fishes, and we can see that the um, richest, uh, the richest places are around uh, New Zealand, around South America, and uh, here we have standardized phylogenetic diversity. Standardized because uh, when you calculate PD, it is always positively correlated with um, species richness. So it will also always will be greater when you when you have more species, and it's uh, have to be corrected. So the standardized PD. If you look at uh, the areas, marine protected areas here here, we can see that uh, phylogenetic diversity is quite low. Actually, it's it is lowest. So it's not really representative to me for the fishes. Then we have the results for pycnogonids. Well, it's a bit different, but we can say that it's not, the, the hotspots, which are in yellowish colors, are not really included into the um, MPA's existing areas. Same for the Ophuras and for antizones. Well, if we combine uh, the uh, phylogenetic diversity of these four groups, we could uh, try uh, to use this to decide where can we um, implement a new MPA. And as if you remember, there were several of them at the Eastern Antarctica. Well, it would be a nice idea, but don't forget that we uh, were uh, basing, uh, this is based on only these four groups. It could change if we add some other groups. And the second part of this work uh, that I've just started to explore is, I would like to explain the phylodiversity distributions by species environment. And uh, so I started with fishes because uh, they have the most complete data. Uh, if you look at the linear reg regressions of um, phylogenetic diversity of fishes, it increased because, okay, sorry, this is zero, this is minus uh, 6,000. So uh, it increased with the depth, mean depth, and it also increased with annual temperature of the sea surface. So, and uh, if we take a look at uh, the same relations, but uh, if we use the uh, general additive models, we can see that, okay, here the depths mean, uh, the, the phylogenetic diversity increased with the depth mean, but it's more curvy relation uh, with the annual temperatures. And we have this interesting decrease uh, of phylogenetic diversity of fishes uh, around five degrees. So um, I didn't have time to really think about it, uh, about which processes and why we have this result, but it could be because uh, there are uh, many species which are really close relatives and adapted to this, to these temperatures. And uh, as they are closely related, their PD is uh, decreasing. Or uh, on the other hand, it could be uh, many, uh, a few species, but really um, uh, distantly related on the tree. And okay, maybe I don't have time, but this is the last uh, thing that I'm doing. Uh, and I'm trying to um, 
to, uh, to do the phylogenetic regionalization. It's another way to use uh, the phylogenetic diversity uh, and incorporate it to biogeographic regionalization. So basically, I'm trying to classify the grid cells where I calculated my PD as presently. And uh, by using this uh, quite nice um, air R package, uh, these grid cells will be um, will be classified together if they share more branch lengths. So if they share more close relatives related species than the other cells. So um, this is a, a nice way to uh, understand the past evolutionary processes that uh, shaped uh, the picture that we have today uh, of um, species phylogenetic diversity pattern. Well, so um, conclusions uh, so far, uh, existing current network of the MPAs is not really representative of the phylogenetic of groups that we accessed and the hotspots remain in cover, uh, uncovered. So uh, there are also environmental drivers uh, of this uh, phylogenetic diversity that have to be understood. And uh, finally, it would be uh, nice to propose how could we use phylogenetic uh, to include it into conservation measures uh, in the Thorfinn Ocean. So this is it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we have to move to last speaker, Stephen Noel. And the presentation is unique geothermal chemistry ships microbial communities on Mount Terebus, Antarctica. Great. Hopefully you all can see my screen OK. Yes, we can see it okay. perfectly. Great. Uh, so thank you all for sticking around. Uh, I know we're already over time, so I will try to um, do the best I can. Um, so my name is Stephen. I'm a postdoc at uh, the University of Waikato in Hamilton, New Zealand. <clears throat> and I'm going to be taking us out of the world of cold in Antarctica into the world of hot, uh, talking about microorganisms that live on Mount Erebus. Uh, so before I start, I just want to say two things quickly. Uh, first is that all the data I'm presenting today um, is from a paper we published earlier this year in Frontiers Microbiology. And I put a QR code up there uh, if you want to explore the, this paper more later. Um, also, I came onto this project near the end. So a lot of people have gone before me um, from sample collection to DNA extraction and sample processing and analysis. Um, and I won't list everyone there because I don't have time, but um, just to say that um, uh, a lot of people have done a lot of work on this project. Um, and um, this project is also funded by uh, Marsden Fund here in New Zealand. So first off, uh, why are we interested in microorganisms that live in geothermal areas to start with? Uh, so one big reason is that in geothermal areas, um, we have extremes in um, uh, in the environment. So extremes in temperature, extremes in chemistry. Um, and so those extremes in the environment require extremes in the metabolism and physiology of the organisms living there. And oftentimes we find um, novel metabolic pathways, novel microorganisms. Um, and that's not only um, interesting from a scientific standpoint, um, but it also um, informs our search for life on other planets um, and can lead to biotechnological advances. Um, and in particular, geothermal sites in Antarctica um, have not been studied very much. Um, and they're of a special interest because there's um, there are especially steep gradients between the surrounding environments uh, and the geothermal sites themselves. So we might have air temperatures of negative 20, negative 30 Celsius, uh, while the soil at the geothermal site um, is 65 degrees Celsius year round. Uh, so that makes it really interesting from a scientific standpoint, but it's also really challenging to get to and work on. Um, and as an example, these samples were collected from Erebus um, during the field season a few years ago, and the team was up on the mountain for two weeks and they got in two days of science. Um, so it's pretty challenging working in these sorts of environments. 
And uh, just to orient you all to where Mount Erebus is, which is our study site for um, this presentation. Um, so it's located here on Ross Island, um, really close to Scott Base and McMurdo Station. Um, so Erebus is unique um, in a lot of ways from a volcanic standpoint. Um, it's pretty isolated from other major volcanic areas, um, and it's also um, has some unique uh, chemistry going on on its summit. So it's a pretty interesting study site for um, its isolation and its unique chemistry. Uh, and across the Erebus summit, there's a lot of different geothermal features. Um, you might have uh, ice caves like this one, or ice hummocks, or ice chimneys, or ice towers, or ice fingers, uh, or uh, spots where there's just hot soil, uh, or fumaroles where there's steam coming out of the ground. So there's a really broad diversity of geothermal um, activity happening on the Erebus summit, um, not just the main crater with the lava and everything. Um, but um, these geothermal features are usually concentrated into a few sites. Uh, and one of the sites that's um, had a lot of uh, interest over the years is called Tramway Ridge. Um, so that's located here on the Mount Erebus summit. Uh, so despite the name, Tramway Ridge, um, it's actually quite sheltered. Um, so uh, you can find here a lot of um, active fumaroles with a lot of steam. Um, there's a lot of moss and lichen beds going um, uh, well established here. Uh, and the soil is usually about 65 degrees Celsius in the hot spots um, uh, year round. Um, so uh, past studies of microbial communities on Mount Erebus have concentrated on Tramway Ridge. Um, and these past two studies um, have found uh, the microorganisms on the surface of um, these hot spots in Tramway Ridge are fairly cosmopolitan. Um, but the deeper you get, um, the more novel and endemic the microbes are. And so we wanted to, to um, start to expand our knowledge of the microbes living on Mount Erebus uh, and what factors might be driving their um, distribution. Uh, and so we picked um, a contrasting site on Mount Erebus, uh, Western Crater, located here. Um, it's not that far distance-wise, but it's very different. Um, so again, despite the name Western Crater, it's actually quite exposed. Um, so the wind comes whipping around the corner of the mountain there. Um, so it's really windy. Um, there's no fumaroles or visible um, phototrophic activity, um, just a bunch of hot soil patches, um, like you can see in this picture here. Um, and it's not as hot. Usually the, the hottest you'll find at Western Crater is about 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, so um, the team collected uh, a few sets of samples. Um, they um, started at, the hot, at a hot spot and then moved um, towards a colder region. And so we have these uh, temperature gradient um, samples along temperature gradients from Tramway Ridge and Western Crater. Uh, and we used um, uh, DNA sequencing uh, using the 16S rRNA gene. Um, to get an idea of the microbial community inhabiting um, these sites, and then paired that with some uh, chemical analyses, ICPMS, um, to try to understand what sort of environmental factors might be um, influencing the communities there. So two main questions I'm going to answer today. Uh, are the microbial communities at these two sites different? Uh, and if so, what sort of environmental factors might be driving those differences? Uh, so first off, I'm just going to talk briefly about the geochemistry of these sites. Um, and uh, for, for the purposes of um, this uh, presentation, um, I'm just, a lot of these um, uh, features I've just averaged across um, all of the samples, even though they're collected along a uh, temperature transect. Uh, so we can see at Tramway, uh, the two sites are very different chemically. So Tramway Ridge um, is much more acidic than Western Crater. Um, whereas um, Tramway Ridge um, also has uh, higher conductivity, uh, higher soil moisture content, higher total carbon, higher total nitrogen. Um, and this all makes sense uh, when we think about the, the topography of the two sites. Uh, Western Crater is a lot more exposed, and so uh, the soil is going to be a lot drier. Um, there's not as much um, uh, phototrophic activity. So at Western Crater, so we see a lot less nitrogen fixation going on, so a lot lower nitrogen levels. 
Um, and interestingly enough, the pH issues, um, uh, when we look into it a little bit deeper, we have samples from across the Erebus summit. Uh, and when you average the pH of all of the samples we have from all across the Erebus summit, um, Trailway Ridge is actually an outlier. Uh, it's quite acidic compared to um, everywhere, else, everywhere else you find on um, the Erebus summit, um, which will be of interest as we go on. So we know the two sites are different chemically. Uh, what about in terms of the microbial community? Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a PCA plot. Uh, and the important thing here is that each of these dots um, is the, represents the microbial community um, at a single sample. Uh, and so the closer two dots are to each other, um, the more similar the communities are at those two samples. Uh, and I, I didn't mention this before, but we do have two temperature transects at Tramway Ridge. And uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to lump them together. Um, but the big thing to take away from this figure is that uh, the Western Crater samples are much more similar to each other than they are to the Tramway Ridge samples. Um, and when you color it by pH, uh, we get an idea of what might be driving that or hinting at driving that. Um, but it does appear the two communities are different. And when we start looking at um, who's living there, uh, the kingdom level, so each of these bars um, is a separate uh, sample. Um, and we're just comparing bacteria and archaea um, at uh, these two sites. And you can see that the tramway ridge samples all have archaea present, um, sometimes making up even half of the microorganisms living there. Whereas Western Crater, uh, you don't hardly find any archaea at all. Uh, and when you go into the um, community analysis at the phylum level, uh, there's a lot of information here, um, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. Again, each of these bars is the microbial community at one sample. Uh, and these two here are the Tramway Ridge ones, and this is the Western Crater sample. Um, so first of all, again, at the phylum level, we see uh, archaea. Uh, the Thaumarchaea um, are only present at Tramway Ridge. Um, you hardly find any at Western Crater. And, and those are the only archaea that we found in our samples were from that one phylum. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in Western Crater, uh, we see a lot of these acidobacteria at Western Crater, but we don't see hardly any of them at Tramway Ridge. Uh, and when we dig into it um, at the level of um, individual sequences, uh, we can see from this heat map um, that same difference showing up again. So all the acidobacteria sequences we found um, come exclusively from Western Crater, uh, whereas uh, the Thaumarchaea sequences are pretty much only found at Tramway Ridge. Uh, and when you look at um, the sorts of um, environmental uh, influences of or uh, habitat preferences for these different um, sequences. I'm talking about this on the phylum level, but when you dig into the um, what's related at the genus level, um, the acidobacteria we find at Western Crater um, are closely related to um, bacteria that mainly prefer high pH soils. Uh, and so um, they really can't survive at Tremor Ridge because it's just too acidic for them. Whereas the Thaumarchaeta we see um, generally require a lower pH. Um, and they also are related to um, Thaumarchaea that um, oxidize ammonia. And so the higher nitrogen levels at Tramway Ridge may also be um, influencing their abundance at Tramway Ridge. Uh, and so we, we can also do um, to try to get this um, uh, better statistical um, idea of what environmental factors are driving these community differences. Uh, we can do a correlation analysis. Um, so each of these um, dots here again is the microbial community, each of these samples. Uh, we see Western Crater separating out from Tramway Ridge again. Uh, and each of these arrows here is a different environmental factor uh, with the label here. And the, um, the strength of the correlation of that environmental factor with the microbial community um, indicates, is indicated by the length of that arrow. Uh, and the direction tells you uh, what direction that um, factor is going. So for instance, here, uh, the Western Crater samples with the arrow, the pH pointing through it. Um, so the highest pH samples are all at Western Crater. Uh, and so that was the strongest correlating factor we found was pH. Uh, so it seems that pH is one of the major factors driving the difference 
um, in these two microbial communities. Uh, and, and interestingly, even though these samples were collected along a temperature gradient from a hot um, sample to a colder sample, uh, temperature really is only a, a minor factor um, in influencing the community that's there. Uh, there's also a host of other uh, factors that are important here, but I don't have time to talk about them today. Uh, also, uh, going back to this figure again, um, with the remaining last few minutes, I just want to highlight something else. Um, and that is that across all of the samples that we found, uh, we can find uh, samples, um, microorganisms from chloroflexi and proteobacteria. Um, they're present in all samples. Uh, and when you look at the specific um, organisms that we found, uh, we find um, microorganisms from classes like chinodonobacteria, chloroflexia, et cetera. Uh, and all of the most closely related microbes to these organisms in our samples um, have the capacity for metabolizing gases, um, especially carbon dioxide, and so um, carbon dioxide fixation, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen. And these are all gases that are produced by Mount Erebus. Um, and so our um, one hypothesis is that the reason these microbes are present across all of these sites, both of these sites, is that they're metabolizing gases that are being produced, um, that are present at both sites. Uh, and these predictions, of course, we need to be followed up with uh, metagenomics and culturing work to confirm that hypothesis. Uh, so just to, to wrap up, um, different geothermal sites on Mount Erebus have different communities um, at the microbial level, um, and pH is a large driver of those differences, um, with other soil parameters being important as well. Um, and we can look at the, um, at the specifics. Um, Thalmarchiota are only present at Tramway Ridge, and that may be partly due to pH and partly due to nitrogen levels, um, whereas the Cytobacteria are only at Western Crater. Um, and the common members of these communities um, may be involved in um, gas metabolism as well. Uh, one last thing is that these communities are rich in a lot of potential unknowns. So there are a lot of sequences here that couldn't be assigned even at the file level. Um, so these um, communities are really an interesting source of further study. And with that, thank you for watching. And um, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your talk. And now we have some questions. There are two questions for Byron Adams, as one of the two has been resolved. We, I have to ask you to answer very shortly because we are over the time. The first one is by Hector. Did you find evidences of mercury near the Cretaceous Paleogene limit? Hi, uh, so we have calculated the mercury against sulfur ratio for the section. And in general, we can see that there is an increase. Uh, I mean, the values are higher in the Maastrichtian when compared to the KPG transition. However, uh, values fluctuate too much. And so we didn't have a clear signal to make uh, paleoenvironmental interpretations. And that's why we didn't put the, this, this curve there in this study. Thank you. The second question is from Laura Zucconi to Byron Adams. Very interesting presentation. A huge challenge to put all these diverse data together. The difference in vegetation between the poles and high altitude sites is significant. Does it deeply affect the associated soil community? Which kind of differences and difficulties you found in comparing high altitudes and polar sites? This is a terrific question, Laura. Um, and it would have required us to partition our data set between the polar sites and the high elevation or high altitude sites. And it's something that we could have done, and we would have certainly lost a lot of our statistical power by partitioning those out. But it does sound like something that might be fun to do. Um, our, our objective really was to see if there were like universals uh, given all of the data all at once. And, I, and, 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 it, and we found some, and I think that they are applicable to what we would find at the polar sites. So I think that when we think about um, the potential for dispersal for some of these organisms to polar sites from montane sites and elsewhere, 
I think that we would predict that we would see these very same patterns even in Antarctica, and we certainly do see them in the Arctic. There's a great question, though. I, I'm tempted to go back and maybe partition those out and see if uh, any of the trends change between the polar sites and the high elevation sites. Thank you. Another question is for Stephen Noel. Thank you, very interesting presentation. Mount Melbourne is another volcanic site in Victoria land, close to the Dalian base. It is a specially protected area also for the abundance of lichen and moss beds. Have you planned to make comparison with other volcanic sites? It would be nice to lurch the study to other sites. Yeah, good, great question. Uh, you anticipated our next steps. Um, so actually I have, I'm currently working on um, samples from, <clears throat> excuse me, Mount Melbourne um, and Mount Ritman as well. So those are the other two uh, volcanic sites um, near Erebus. Um, and we have samples that I'm analyzing at this point and I'm preparing for a publication. So uh, yes, and um, there's some very interesting findings that actually looks like the communities at Mount Melbourne are very similar to those at Western Crater. Um, <clears throat> which makes sense because they're they're fairly similar in terms of geothermal, <clears throat> excuse me, geothermal chemistry. Um, but yeah, really good question. Okay. okay, now no more questions. More questions, so because we are very advanced in, in time, I would like to close up our session, okay, Fabi? And yes, I think I like we have to, to close now, unfortunately. Yes. Thank you so, for all of you for your talk and very interesting presentation and discussion of results. We obviously you can still interact with the authors of the session with the SCAR portal and sending emails to further discuss the data. And we want to remind you again, the poster session that is also very interesting. And we want, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Fernanda Quaglia and Virginia Raffi for their support and the SCAR team also for this big effort in the realization of this session. Thank you to everyone. Do you want to add something, Fernanda? Okay, no, you say, you say everything. Okay. Thank you all for being here, for sending your works and we hope to, to be together again in two years. Yeah. And before that, please uh, go to the poster session because we have very, very interesting uh, works there and it would be cool to meet you there too. Okay, so thank you all and see you. Bye.